but uh, what would compromise that is our sin, our focus on idols, our love uh, for things of the world, our distraction with our own plans, our lack of submissiveness to your will. And Lord, we know that sin is too much for us, that, that we can't deal with it on our own, that we're actually owned by it. And so Lord, we ask that you would graciously again save us today, that you would deal with the sin in us so that we could not only hear your voice, but obey for our good and for your glory. Amen. I want to show you a video of something that you wouldn't believe if I told you about it. So I want to prove to you that this actually happens. So we're going to watch that video in a second. Just a disclaimer. There are lions eating wildebeest in this video. And as you would expect, it's quite messy. So um, if you don't want to see that, I don't blame you. But you might want to close your eyes for the next two minutes. All right, let's watch. It's not a super high quality uh, resolution, but it's the best I could get. Do not mess around. Can you imagine walking towards 15 lions on a kill? Your heart racing, the lions staring at your every move, their mouths bloody. Your instinct for self-preservation would be screaming at your legs, run away, move in the other direction, but with force of will, you command your legs to take another step and another step and another step straight towards the jaws of death. That's actually a way that the Maasai people have got food for their tribe for thousands of years. Their warriors go out and steal food from lions and then share it around with the tribe. It's been an essential way to provide food for the community when they need it. And so the tribe has needed to breed the kind of warriors who could do that kind of thing, who have the guts to stare down lions. Which of us would do that? I mean, other than Mike Hanneth. And of course, Mike Hanneth would not hesitate, and we know that the lions would poop themselves when they saw this bare-chested man bearing down upon them. But the rest of us would never even consider stealing food from lions unless somebody had taught us how to do it and trained us how to master our fear in a situation like that. The Maasai create those kinds of warriors, and they do it through the most insane rite of passage known to human beings. In order to become a man amongst the Maasai, a teenage boy is sent out into the savannah by himself with nothing but a, spe a spear, and he has to come back to the tribe with a lion head. You are not a man amongst the Maasai until you have ambushed and killed a lion by yourself with a spear. With a spear. At least that's how it used to be uh, 15 years ago because the lion populations were decreasing. They stopped this practice. But until 15 years ago, when boys were sent out from the tribe, they either came back with a lion head as a man or they didn't come back at all. And I think the thinking is something like this. If you're the kind of man who can ambush a lion and kill it with a spear, then you're also the kind of man who can intimidate lions, get their food, and so provide for our community. So hunting a lion is a defining moment for a teenage boy amongst the Maasai. Facing a lion not only signals to that boy that he's become a man, but facing that lion actually creates that man. In that moment, he becomes a warrior. And imagine the, the, the boys who go out to hunt lions don't know themselves what kind of men they are. You know, am I the caliber of man who can walk into the jaws of death, face a lion, steal the food, and provide for the women and children in my tribe, or am I a coward? Will I run away and just try to preserve my own life? Until they killed that lion, they didn't know which one they were. Through initiation with lions, the Maasai teach young people not only courage and bravery, but they teach them 
one very important truth, that your life is not about you. I've been talking about this idea of initiation. All over the world, primal cultures initiate their youths into adulthood through really harsh and intense tests of character, through painful and difficult rites of initiation. And those rites signal to those youths that they not only have become adults, but they also teach the truths that you need to know in order to be an adult. They make adults out of you. And what's really interesting is that God seems to also be in this same business of initiating people into spiritual adulthood. We see God testing and proving Jesus in a 40-day test in the wilderness. We see God driving David into the desert and making him fit for kingship. We see him sending Moses into exile. We see him testing the entire nation of Israel as they're forced to go through the Red Sea. And we see Jesus putting his disciples through similar kinds of tests of character. Everyone with whom God gets involved has to go through initiation. You are not ready to take on the destiny that God has for you until you learn the hard way. You can't learn these truths just by somebody like me telling you about them. Initiation is never fun. It is always hard. It is always difficult. It is always painful. But through it, God transforms us for good. Afterwards, we come out different people, grown-up people, spiritual adults ready to serve the people God has called us to. Through tests and trials, God teaches us that, and I've gone through this so far, first of all, life is hard. Second of all, you are not in control. And third, that your life is not about you. That's what I want to talk about today. I want to tell you the story of God initiating a young woman named Esther. God taught her that her life was not about her by bringing her face to face with a lion and giving her the chance either to walk towards the lion or run away and preserve herself. God will put each of us into situations like he did with Esther. He will lead us into critical tests where we will have to choose. Is our life going to be about ourselves or is it going to be about God? So I want to tell you Esther's story so you can be prepared when that moment comes for you. Esther was a Jew in the Persian Empire uh, living 500 years before Jesus. And there were a lot of Jews living in Persia at the time. Uh, a couple hundred years before Esther was around, the Babylonians invaded Israel, took all the Israelites captive, and took them off to Babylon. So Esther's great-grandparents were amongst those exiles. A couple hundred years later, though, the, the Persians conquered the Babylonians and then took their people to their capital city called Susa. And that's where Esther was born. We don't know why, but Esther's parents died young. And so her cousin, whose name was Mordecai, who was much older than her, adopted her as his own daughter. Mordecai was a very attentive father. He loved Esther, and he brought her up very intentionally. And Esther was an obedient daughter. She did whatever Mordecai told her to do. Despite losing her parents young, as far as you know, Esther's early life was predictable, it was normal, it was average, but everything changed for her when she caught the eye of scouts searching for beautiful women to be King Xerxes' queen. King Xerxes was the king of the Persian Empire, and he needed a, be a beautiful new queen because he had just divorced his old beautiful queen. Her name was Vashti. Uh, and she ticked him off one night when he was having a drunken party with a bunch of his pals, and he sent word to her that he wanted her to come and display her beauty before his friends. She wasn't in the mood and refused. So Xerxes, king of the most powerful empire in the entire world, called together all his chiefs of staff and his political advisors, and he said, what should I do? My wife won't do what I say, which is what any real man does when his wife won't comply. He gathers the guys and grouses about it. 
all these geniuses put their heads together and they all agreed that what Xerxes should do is divorce Vashti. And so he did. And the next great idea that they had was that there should be scouts that should be sent out throughout the entire empire to find all the most beautiful virgins that were out there. They should gather them together, and then Xerxes should have his pick. Not a patriarchal society at all. It actually gets a lot worse than that. Every one of these contenders for queen had to spend a night with Xerxes in his bedroom. And the ones that he didn't want after that night were sent away into his harem where they would live in seclusion for the rest of their lives. Great guy, Xerxes. Very considerate of the opposite sex. How did Esther and Xerxes' story come together? Esther was a beautiful, young, unmarried woman. The scouts spotted her and they took her to be one of these women that would be a tryout for queen. But before she was taken by those scouts, Mordecai instructed her to be silent about her ethnicity. He wanted her to be, keep it a secret that she was a Jew. Why? Because anti-Semitism has almost always been a thing. And despite the fact that the whole tryout for queen thing was really messed up, and that both Esther and Mordecai no doubt had some not good feelings about it, Despite that, Mordecai wanted Esther to have the best shot she could at being queen. Becoming queen would be a massive increase in standard of living. And so Mordecai told Esther, don't tell anyone that you are a Jew. I do not want that to hamper your chances. And Esther obeyed. She was taken into the palace and went through 12 months of beauty preparations before she was to meet the king. You guys think that 10 minutes in the bathroom with a blow dryer is a long time. Esther went through an entire year of perfuming and oiling and scenting while she was being made ready to go into the king. And while she was there, she listened very attentively to the keepers of the harem. And she did everything that they told her to do to give her the best shot. So if they said, do this, she did it. Don't do that, she didn't do it. Esther was very childlike and submissive. When the 12 months were done, she went into the king's bedroom to meet him for the first time. Was this absolute horror and repugnance for Esther? No doubt it would be for most women today. But this was a different time. And even normal marriages at the time would be repugnant to women today. So if you uh, were a lady, your parents chose for you, you probably didn't even know the man you were going to marry, he was often much older than you, and he might have had several wives already. So even the normal situation back then would be repugnant today. Did Esther hate the fact that she had to try out sexually to be queen There are reasons to believe that though she no doubt had some trepidation, as you can imagine for a young unmarried woman, Esther didn't think that all of this was the worst thing that could have ever happened to her. And the biggest reason for thinking that is that she was chosen by Xerxes to be queen. The story says this, Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen. If Esther didn't want to be queen, she would not have turned on the charm to win the king over. She was crowned queen, and the king threw a big party. So Esther was now the richest most privileged and perhaps most powerful woman in the entire world. And she got it all handed to her because she was beautiful, she was charming, and she was willing to do what any authority figure in her life told her to do. She was queen, but she had not yet grown up. So far, she just went where fate took her and did whatever she was told to do. She kept her real identity a secret, Because Mordecai told her to, she did exactly what the harem caretakers told her to do, and she tried to please the king, her husband. But a moment was coming where God was going to give her the choice. Is this all going to be about you, or is it going to be about me? 
That moment and that choice came five years after Esther became queen, when her people were faced with genocide. How that happened was the second in command of the king, whose name was Haman, took a hating to the Jews. Haman uh, hated how the Jews refused to fit in. He hated how they would not bow to the Persian gods or assimilate into Persian culture. And it deeply aggravated him that the Jews wouldn't openly make themselves subservient to their Persian oppressors. Haman went to Xerxes and told him, there's a problem. There are people in your empire who will not assimilate. They don't obey our laws. That was a lie. And they're hell-bent on bringing this empire down. That also was a lie. And Xerxes said, well, that's no good. What are we going to do about it? And Haman said, let's kill them. Let's kill them all. Send out an edict to every mayor, every governor, every law enforcement agent in the land and command them that on one single day they are to destroy these people. And Xerxes said, sure, let's do it. Didn't ask who those people were, didn't ask for any evidence of the charges, no deliberation, annihilate them. And so Haman went out, sent messages across the empire, and waited with sadistic anticipation for this day when his so-called enemies would be destroyed. When Mordecai, who was, of course, a Jew, found out about this plot, he was in front of the city gate, and he tore his clothes and threw ashes on his head, which is what you did back then when you were very unhappy. And from outside the palace, he sent a message to Esther, telling her to go into the king and beg him for mercy for their people. Now remember, Xerxes didn't even know who the people that he had ordered annihilated were. Neither did he know that his queen was one of those people. Mordecai told Esther that it's time for him to know. And that made a lot of sense, you know, going into your husband because you know that your people are about to be killed off and telling him that you're one of them so that he stops and doesn't do it. Doesn't seem like a huge ask, but there was a reason why this was a very big ask for Esther. In Persia, the law was that no matter who you were, if you went into the king's presence without being summoned first, the sentence was death. So some prior king to Xerxes was a big-time introvert, and he didn't like people. He didn't like talking to them. So he made it a rule that if you came into his presence without invitation, that he could kill you instantly, unless he extended his golden scepter your way. That meant you were forgiven. That sounds stupid and ridiculous, of course, but how did that matter for Esther? She's the queen, right? She's the king's favorite. She sees him all the time. She doesn't need to go into his royal court and be summoned to go there. Apparently not so. After five years, the marriage had cooled, and Xerxes had not seen Esther for 30 days straight at this point, not in public or in private. And so her only option, if she was to talk to the king and beg for mercy, was to walk into his royal court. But Xerxes wouldn't kill her, you know, would he? She's his beloved, beautiful, favored queen. Well, Xerxes had conquered and killed much of the world at this point. He divorced his prior queen because she wouldn't show herself at his drunken party, and he ordered the annihilation of an entire people group over a lunchtime recommendation. So Xerxes had no respect for human dignity. He was entitled. He was unpredictable. He had blood all over his hands. He was a lion, ready to crush anyone who even annoyed him for a moment. And Esther knew that. She sent a message back to Mordecai and said that she did not want to risk death by going into Xerxes' presence unsummoned. Mordecai got her message at the palace gate. And when he read it, he quickly wrote down another message to be sent back to her. And this is what it said. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position 
for such a time as this. Who knows but that you have come to your position for such a time as this. Mordecai is saying to Esther, up to this point, your life has been about you. You were born a beauty. You got charm. People like you. You're smart. All of that took you to the top. You've got the things other people only dream of having, luxury, status, unending leisure. But now, you and I can both see that all of that wasn't about you. You've gotten where you've got to the top because someone has a job for you up there. You've come to where you are at for this moment, for such a moment as this. Will you walk into the presence of the lion and risk death for your people? Or will you run away and save your own life? It's initiation time. We who live in Fernie are at special risk for thinking that life is about us. Why does anyone move to Fernie? It's not because they want to serve the poor because there's not a whole lot of them here. It's not because they want to provide services for a community that doesn't have many because we have a raft of them. It's not because the community spirit is low and needs a lot of encouragement because it's not. People move to Fernie because it's one of the best places in the world to live. People move to Fernie because they want to ski and mountain bike and fly fish and hike and hunt and paddle and ATV and wakeboard and body carve and yoga and granola crunch their faces off. (laughs) And they want to do it away from the rest of the people in the world. No one lives here because they are looking for a rough place where they can dig in and give their life away. The water that we swim in is the good life. And there's nothing wrong about that. The good life is good. It's a blessing. But maybe when you are swimming in the good life all the time, it will seem extra special, not normal, when God comes in and gives you a choice for your life to be not about you. It's like, hmm, that doesn't feel right. That's not in line with the kind of life I'm sculpting for myself here. I was writing this sermon on Wednesday when I got a phone call. I was writing the words of the opening illustration. Literally, I just finished, no lie, this sentence. Am I the caliber of man who can do what it takes to keep women and children fed, or am I a coward? I had just finished writing that sentence when the phone rang, and on the other end of the line was child services, and they said, we have a 15-month-old boy can't go back to his home tonight. This is too dangerous. Will you take the child? We don't know how long it will be for. It might be indefinitely. It's like right now, is your life about you or is it about God? My wife had travel plans this weekend in Vancouver. I had fishing plans, which we all know are paramount, not to mention a million other plans in the future that another 15-month-old boy that I don't know would ruin. But I don't doubt that God had a smile on his face as I squirmed in the sermon writing chair. You're going to preach that? (laughs) All right? You get the first test, son. Are you going to walk into the risk or are you going to preserve your own life? Living in Fernie makes those kinds of moments all the more strange. They are out of character with the kind of life that we are shaping for ourselves here. But God smiles and orchestrates defining moments in our lives. Where Jesus puts the choice before us. It's like, you say you're my follower. You know, lay me down. In a moment of emotion, you surrendered and said, take my life, God. It's not mine. It's yours. And God's like, well, let's see whose life it really is. Is it yours or is it mine? Is it going to be about you or is it going to be about me? Do not think that God has not been involved in your past, preparing you for a job that he will assign you. You may see in your past a set of coincidences and random events that have brought you to the place you are at, just as Esther did. But there will come a moment probably more than one, where it will become clear that you have become to your 
You've come to your position for such a time as this. When that moment comes, do not shrink back. Do not walk away from the lion. Walk towards it. If you do, you will be made in that moment into the queen, into the warrior that God has destined you to be. If you do not, God will take care of the problem by himself with somebody else, just as Mordecai says, but you will miss out big time. What did Esther do? Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast from me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. People who know that their lives are not about them know that they are only a vessel for God's purposes. They know that their gifts and their talents and their possessions and their position isn't theirs. It's not, even, it's not about their strengths. It's not about their weaknesses. It's not about them. It's about God. It's about his plans and his power and them being submitted to his will. And so Esther emptied herself of her own plans and her own dreams, her own homes, and she symbolized that by emptying herself of food and laid her life before God for him to do as he willed. And then she walked into the presence of the lion. She went to meet King Xerxes. I don't have time to tell you the rest of the story. You'll have to read it for yourself. God saved his people through Esther because she was willing to walk towards the lion instead of away. And not only did God save the Jews through Esther, but he grew her up into that moment. She became someone that wasn't just doing what everybody else told her to do, but she took a hold of her destiny and became a partner with God in shaping the future. Defining moments. Jesus is bringing them your way. What will you choose? You or God? This last week, what did I choose? Me and my wife talked about it, uh, and we decided to say yes, but not indefinitely. So we called back in half an hour, but by that time, a prior plan that had fallen through for this child came back onto the table, and he was able to go into that safe place. So I don't know if we passed the test or not, but it's grateful for God bringing it our way. Let's pray together. C+. plus. That's right there. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> Lord, um, we thank you that you don't allow us um, to waste our lives. We know that the life that you have for us, though it might be more difficult at times, is a better life, one that's more satisfying for us, one where we know you more, one where we get to see the joy of you working through us. Lord, we know that you're always drawing us out uh, of, of, of sin and distraction that we've entangled ourselves in. Thank you, Lord, that you have purchased grace for us through giving your own son on the cross, that he was willing to pass every test for us so that we wouldn't have to pass them all perfectly. We draw on, on the grace that he bought for us with his own blood. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for turning away from jobs that you have for us. And we say, uh, yes, Lord, bring them again. We open up our hearts, we open up our lives to the work that you would do through us. Amen.
can speak generally this is very important the gentle whisper and so we we think about the gentle whisper that we heard as the word was preached we think of the correction the instruction say yes to wherever you are leading us and we ask that you would give us the, the strength and the energy to lean in uh, to the steps you're calling us to take. Lord, we think now of someone we know who needs your love, someone who is hurting, whether it's physically or mentally or lonely, and Lord, we think about them and pray for them. someone who needs to know you desperately, who, uh, who doesn't know you now and who needed love uh, for, for you to meet, for, for them to meet you and for that to change the course of their life. We pray for them now. Father, we thank you that you partner with us through prayer that uh, somehow mysteriously you do your will through our prayers. And so we thank you that you've heard us, that you're already working on these things. There's nothing that surprises you. It was out of your control. We surrender our lives, our future, our family's future to you and to your, your good, powerful, omnipotent hands. Amen. I'm going to invite Kevin up, uh, our board chair. He's going to give us an update on the congregation meeting this last week. Are we? Oh, yeah, we're good. Um, thanks. So uh, if you were not busy on Monday night, you might have joined us for our AGM. Um, it was uh, super exciting if you missed it. If you were there, please don't tell everybody how exciting it was. Um, but the great thing was we did have 11 new members voted in uh, at our meeting, which is amazing for our church. Yep, please clap. That's great news. Uh, in addition, we had two new board members elected, uh, and if you know the name uh, Tim Schindel and James Bosma, um, you probably have been to Sparwood before because they're both out of our Sparwood campus, so that's pretty awesome and exciting that we've got them uh, joining. Now, one thing that uh, we realized after the board meeting that I messed up, uh, and I know you probably can't believe that I mess up, but I do, um, is that we actually accidentally retired Jamie Weber a year early, and we forgot to uh, give Margaret Carruthers the opportunity to come back in and serve for another three years. So somehow we had their retirement dates or their end of term dates mixed up. And so you're probably going to see an announcement coming out in the next few days where we're going to hold a very, very, very brief meeting to re-elect Margaret Carruthers back in because the board would love to have her back because she's been a huge part of what our board has done for the past three years. So that is uh, going to be coming down the line. Um, but we have, we will have, uh, once Margaret gets reelected back on, we'll have eight members on our board, which is super exciting and it's a super strong board. So we're really excited about that. Um, additionally, um, and this is another exciting thing, our budget was approved. Our budget uh, is for just over $550,000 uh, for 2022, which is actually a very aggressive budget. and. Um, so it's going to take a lot of uh, effort in giving to uh, make those numbers, but we're also going to have some really cool fundraising ideas coming out for things like missions and for youth and that sort of thing. Uh, so stay tuned for that. A um, couple of little business items that we wanted to mention, and there's more stuff in the uh, AGM. We're hoping to get the recording up here sometime this week if you missed it. Um, but uh, 
We have had a Sparwood intern fund as one of the things you can give to here uh, at our church. We will no longer have that fund because we no longer have intentions of getting another intern in Sparwood. Our intern in Sparwood, Jesse, is coming back as a youth pastor uh, starting in June. So we're super excited about that. And uh, we've already seen some great growth in our youth and uh, children's ministries in Sparwood because of what Jesse's done for us. So we're, we're super excited. So if you've been giving to that, please keep giving, but just do it to the general fund instead of to the Sparwood intern fund. Um, and uh, one other little quick note um, is that we have had uh, people give uh, gifts in kind to the church in the past, and uh, we are going to be coming up with some rules around doing that because CRA has some uh, things that they get a little bit sticky about when people give gifts in kind. Uh, so if you do have any interest in giving something to the church that's not uh, dollars and cents, please talk to a board member first uh, because it will require board approval. Uh, and that's it. Good Friday and Easter are always a really exciting time for us as a church. Um, they have been not very exciting in the last two years because of COVID, but really excited this year that all restrictions will be off, so we'll be able to celebrate together. So we will have a Good Friday service. Uh, we'll also have a really fun Easter service. We're planning on setting up the big old bouncy castle outside and uh, grilling the AAA best hot dogs that you can find and having an Easter egg hunt. And from what we can see, there's not a whole lot going on in the community at Easter time, so it's a cool opportunity for you to invite your friends so they can have a good time with us. So think about who you might invite to join us, maybe on Good Friday, but especially on Easter Sunday. Uh, we've been talking a lot and a lot about this Extreme Character Challenge and also the women's version Arise. Just want to put that again on your radar just to know that the XEC is the first weekend in June. So you men who need to save time off and everything, uh, if you want to come to that, if you're thinking about coming to that, come and uh, go online. You can register online. If you put in XEC Alberta, you'll be taken to a site where you can register for that. Same thing for Arise. It's called Arise Canada. Uh, if you want to go, you're a lady, you want to join on a pilgrimage in the mountains, that's in the middle of July. We got maybe a couple ladies that are going. A bunch went on last year. A couple might go this year. May you go with Jesus' words ringing in your ears. I am with you. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. Go in peace. <laughs>